All right, everybody, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Chris Smith, and I am your host every Wednesday at noon for our Lunchtime Lecture Program, brought to you by the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It's good to be with everybody again, but uh, you know, this week happens to be a very special week because from Monday all the way until this coming Saturday, here at the museum, we are celebrating Bug Fest. That's right. This is Bug Fest 2021, Plan B. Get it? B, Plan B. Because everything is virtual this year, except for a couple of small events uh, happening on Saturday. So with the way the world is, we have had to do that great pivot into the virtual space for our biggest event of the year, but we've been having an amazing time. We've heard from experts across the world of entomology, bugs and insects, and arthropods so far this week. Exciting talks Monday, Tuesday, and this morning. This talk for the Lunchtime Discovery Series is being included in our Bug Fest programming because we have a very special guest who's going to be sharing some really cool and interesting stuff with us, so stick around. Uh, and there are more Bug Fest programs this afternoon and again tomorrow on Thursday. Make sure that you visit bugfest.org in order to get more details about the programs that are coming up so that you can get signed up, get the links, and come and join us. Also, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel right here. You're already here. The button is right there. You can click, click the bell to get notified. And then when we're going live with more of our great Bugfest programming or future lunchtime discovery series programs, you can join up, tap the notification, and just come and find us right here, where we're always meeting interesting people and learning interesting things. Since this is BugFest, we've got a very special guest today. Uh, if you've had opportunity to visit the museum and explore the Nature Research Center a little bit, that's the kind of newer building of the museum, then there's a chance you would have seen, maybe even taken a picture of yourself with, the fabulous honeybee mural that's right outside the doors of the museum. Well, today, for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, we have the artist of that mural and someone who's painted uh, tens of thousands of bees all over the place. That artist is Matt Willie. Matt, welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Thanks, Chris. It is an honor to be here. I'm so excited about Bug Fest. You know, my most of my life is about bugs these days, and specifically <laughs> bees and pollinators are my specialty. But I am so excited that this event actually happens um, because there's not that many big gatherings that go on where people are coming together around the amazing little creatures called bugs and pollinators. And so I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, my name is Matt Willie. I'm an artist. Um, more specifically, these days, a lot of the time, I'm an art activist. And um, I founded a global art project called The Good of the Hive, which the North Carolina Museum of Sciences is a participant in. But this global art project is based on my commitment to hand paint 50,000 individual honeybees in murals around the world. Now the 50,000 is the number, it's a average number of, in, of bees and of honeybees in a healthy thriving hive. You know, but what I'm doing is I'm painting really a metaphor for, for us, you know, the bee to her hive is us to our world. You know, I decided to create an organization around it. I'm gonna tell you the whole story about how all of that happened. But I wanted to create something that would generate radical curiosity, connection, and change. Because pollinators and pollination is a huge issue globally. The bug decline across the world is a huge issue, but I wanted to see how my art could be of service to this. And um, I actually, yeah, I, I really had a blast at that. I just want to give a plug for Bug Fest. If you guys have a chance, to, if you're out there and you're close enough to, or can in, go see the museum and stuff, they have great exhibits, but also just engaging this week in um, the world of bugs, because I had the, the gift of being able to be there for one of them. And it was a blast. People, There's more to learn about bugs than you ever thought possible. And, um, 
Um, but with that said, you know, this talk is not really about bees or bugs. My talk is, a, it was definitely inspired by bees, um, but I'm gonna tell you about what I do and why the bees are important in that equation. Um, but I first wanna ask you a couple of questions and they're not to answer right now, but there's something to think about. How do we get people curious and excited about planetary health, social justice, food systems, pollinators, bug health, soil health? Um, how do we inspire each other to create the kind of change that is needed in the world right now? Those are the kinds of questions I ask myself all the time. That is the kind of, um, those are the kinds of questions that, that the good of the hive is all about. I mean, and, and one of my visions for this is what if people were actually excited to change the world instead of daunted, intimidated? Like how do we work with the good of the hive and the bees? And that's what I'm, I really wanna share with you today. Um, and it's what my work is all about. So I use this example sometimes when I'm talking about, when I'm, when I'm trying to explain what I do. Um, imagine, um, well, first of all, a person doing something is always more interesting than someone telling you something. And I'm kind of going a little meta right now because I'm telling you about what I do, but the, but just stick with me for a second and imagine there's a person on the street and they're looking up. You see it in movies all the time. Like there's some person up there, theoretically, you automatically know maybe somebody's going to jump or something. And someone sees them looking up and then they walk over and they look up. And that gets that, that energy of curiosity going. Um, and suddenly there's a whole group of people looking up at the same thing. Now, if you have someone running around screaming at them, to, to look up there. That can be a great thing if there's an urgent situation. If there's an emergency situation, we get people involved. But that isn't a way to create sustainable change. Letting people come to it on their own terms and experience it and get curious. Curious, curiosity is a sustainable energy in all of us. And when we create that curiosity, people naturally create change with their own life just by what they begin to go and explore. So imagine replacing the, the person debating whether they wanna jump off the building up there with a muralist, with someone up on a, a scaffolding or someone up three stories high on a lift. That is what I do. I don't just create pieces that I leave behind. I stay and I work for four, six, sometimes 14 weeks to create the energy around the piece that we create together by people coming to it on their own terms and having their own experience with it. Um, so, and I came to doing this work mainly because I met a bee. You know, I'm gonna tell you the full story about that, but, um, but when I met this bee in 2008 on the floor of my studio in New York, she showed me something um, and she inspired me to carry a message. And that's what this work, um, that's what I, you know, I create art that shows what I think they were telling me or are telling me as I'm going along. I'm sort of a translator in my mo own mind or a message carrier. And I pay attention to try and connect with nature and the bees in order to see what they might have to say through an artist up onto a wall. Um, and one of the big things that I initially got from this was that she showed me how to see differently. There was, um, you know, an artist is always, we're trained to look, we're trained to see in different ways and manipulate what we're seeing um, or onto a canvas and translate that however that comes through us. And that's a million different ways. As many people, any artists as there are on the planet, that can come in so many different ways. Um, but for me, it was, I was shown this other paradigm, this different way of seeing a bee and the world. And so I literally started to see myself from, go from a person-centric element to this relationship of the bee to her hive. 
I was suddenly, when I met this bee, I started thinking about this, this creature. And over time, it's really evolved. But I thought about, as I thought about it, there was this story from my own days as a student that I saw directly connected. These two experiences were 30 years apart. But I had, um, and I'm just going to tell you that story because it, you'll see why later, I guess, um, or hopefully you will. So I was about 17 years old and I was on a class trip with my art class and we were in a park and I was sitting there trying to draw a tree. I had no real teaching. I hadn't been to art school. I was still in high school, but I was like feverishly trying to paint this or draw this tree leaf by leaf, erasing and my perfectionism was going crazy. And I was searingly looking at this tree trying to represent it. And my teacher came up to me and she had me put my, my pencil down and she showed me negative space. She showed me the idea, the artistic tool um, of negative, negative space. And she said to me, now look at, she showed me that the space around the tree was as important as the tree itself in the creation of the tree. It was not the tree that I was trying to draw. It was the relationship of the tree to what was around it. And that made the tree. And in that moment, I looked up at this tree that I was trying to draw and like focusing on the corner of one leaf. And I saw the whole tree. I saw it in relation to what was around it. It literally looked different. And that moment was one where I realized not only did I want to be an artist, I had the ability to be one. And it was all in like, all of a sudden, a person showed me something different. Like I could see it. And it, it, I've never turned back since. I've been an artist my whole life because of that, really because of that moment. Because it, it's all theory until you really practice it and start to have those moments where you see the world differently. That's what art is all about to me. Um, so um, when I met, I'm going to tell the full story of how I met this bee, but I'm, uh, there was this moment in 2008. And when I was sitting there with this bee, I heard a voice. I don't share this part of the story that often, but I heard a voice and that voice said, this is just about change, another form of change. And, um, you know, at the time, and for a long time, I thought that I was being told that change was coming, some bigger change was coming. But I really think um, she was telling me that she was going to change the way I see the world. And that's the unfolding that happened from this one little experience with a bug. Because, and I'm going to tell you more about that story. Um, but it connected with who I was. This piece of nature saw me in a way or a way to carry a message through me. I mean, I, it sounds rather mystical, but it's kind of true. But what I wanna do before um, I go on with the story is show you all a short two minute video of some of the work. Um, I also, this I put, I've got a piece behind me. This isn't a screen thing. This is an actual <laughs> painting I painted. Um, and this is actually, going to be uh, shown next month, blown up 19 feet by, by 20 some odd feet high and shown on the American embassy in Beijing, China. Um, I've actually got three pieces in that show. It's an art, uh, it's called Art for the People and it's an environmental street art exhibition um, or a street artist. So um, I'm really excited about it. So I wanted to share it with you all. This is something that nobody has seen at this point besides you guys. And, uh, but I wanted to show you some of the work in action. So as I continue to tell the story, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to share my screen. Find that. Share. All right, I'm having a little, oh no, wait, there we go. There we go. It was about 10 years ago and I was in my studio in Manhattan and I turned around and I saw this little tiny honeybee in the middle of the rug. 
and she was moving really slowly so I had this opportunity to get down on the floor and really study this little bee and hang out with her and in that time it took about two and a half hours before she died and I connected with her I connected with the beauty of this little creature that I'd never noticed before That's really how this whole story began. All right, that's a little taste of the work. Um, thanks, I have a, a new website coming up in October, so that's gonna have a lot, new, a lot of new video of a lot of the projects that have happened in the last couple of years. Some of those are a little older, but you might have seen the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in there, et cetera. So I really thought, you know, the, the mission of the good of the hive it, as it's stated on my website, is to ignite radical curiosity for the planet we live on through the lens of art, bees, and storytelling. So I'm really interested in the, the storytelling aspect because over and over again, as I'm on these project sites, people um, will come up to me and they'll share a story about bees. They'll share a story about pollinators. The three-year-old will be lifting up his shirt, showing me where he got stung with like pride and enthusiasm. And there's just something about bugs and bees that, that get people talking about their experiences with them. And so I'm just going to share my experience of how this all happened with you. And, um, it was 2008, as I said, and a bee flew in and landed on the floor of my rug in my studio in Manhattan. And she landed smack dab in the middle. And she was walking and not flying. So I had this opportunity to get down on the floor and hang out with this little bee. And I got out my magnifying glass and I looked at a bee closer than I had in my entire life. I was in my late 30s and I was blown away by the cuteness, first of all. I was like, this looks more like a tiny little puppy with the fuzziness and the antennas and the big eyes than it did a bug. But I'd always experienced them flying around at me, like this flying stinger. That's like how we perceive these amazing creatures sometimes. And so I spent about two hours with this bee and connected with her. And I can't, it was just an emotional connection. And after about two and a half hours, she died and I put her out in the backyard and I came in and I started researching honeybees online. And I came across colony collapse disorder, which back in 2008 was this huge mystery. Like nobody knew what this was like. Millions of bees were dying all over the world and no one knew about it. I was in the middle of Manhattan and I thought, how is there not one article that I've seen on a newspaper or a, or a magazine? And this fascinated me. So I started researching further and I came across some behaviors of the bees. And one in particular blew my mind. It was, it's called altruistic self-removal from the hive. And this is if a bee feels sick and it's in the hive, it will exit the hive and fly off into the abyss for the good of the hive. And that's where the name of my organization and project came from seven or eight years, seven and a half years later. But they take this drastic act 
because they understand that they are inextricably, um, their immune system is inextricably connected to the hive. Their health is based on the health of the hive. And this was years before a pandemic would show us this exact same thing. And suddenly I was like, I'm so much more connected to people than I realized. I understood that in that moment that we're like that too, you know, but we don't act like it because we have this choice. We're not hardwired for it. We have this choice to lean into that or not. And as an artist, it's always the questions that, that drive us, right? So it was fascinating to me. I was walking around, I was in the subway, like, oh my God, I'm so much more connected to all these people than I ever thought. And so um, I just got more and more interested in bees. And um, so I wanted to do something um, and I figured I can paint. <laughs> so I painted murals for, 20 some odd years before that, I've, everything from sports murals um, for an NBA team to high end rooms, you name it, I had painted it. But I was like a traveling muralist. Um, and so in, I had been putting it out there to friends that I really wanted to do one mural to raise some awareness. And a friend of mine, um, about literally seven years later, sent me an iPhone video of the side of a honey company in LaBelle, Florida. And um, it was a fifth generation honey company and beekeeping business, uh, fifth generation. So I just cold called him and I said, would you guys like a mural on your wall to raise some awareness about bees? And they said, we would love a mural on our wall, um, but we have no money to pay you. And murals are illegal in the town of LaBelle. And so I was like, okay, I'm getting way too old to run from the cops. So if you guys can get the law changed, forget about the money, I'll figure out the money. It's sort of a theory of mine in general is like people worry way too much or at least they're stopped from great things because money is like some obstacle. And if I feel compelled, it's not gonna stop me like ever. So. I just told them that, but I hung up the phone after a nice conversation, figuring they were never going to call me back. Why would they? And two months later, they called me up and said, we got the law changed. When are you coming? And I had moved to Asheville, North Carolina at that point, which I didn't even know this, but I had moved one mile from Phyllis Stiles, who was in the process of just starting the city USA and which is now a national organization overseen by Xerxes in hundreds of cities across the country. I just saw a thing that my hometown of Lexington, Massachusetts just became a bee city member, which I was super excited about that. But um, I knew nothing about this, but I had just gone to Asheville for a completely separate reason. But I just put up a, a web page and called it the good of the hive. And I asked some clients and friends and family if they wanted to donate any money is for me to do this mural. And I actually got like $500, uh, basically gas money to go. And so off I went, I had this little Ford, rusty Ford Ranger. I, I headed off to, to LaBelle, Florida. And when I got there, some amazing things happened. Someone put me up in their RV for free for 10 weeks. Uh, restaurants in town were giving me free food. Um, coffee shop wouldn't let me pay for a cup of coffee local beekeepers were dropping off jars of honey with post-it notes on it saying, sell this to raise money for your project. And, and then um, the local newspaper wrote an article that I think hit Facebook or something. And it was all of a sudden these, these donations started coming in. And even from what blew my mind more than anything was that other honey companies were sending me money to paint bees on what in my mind was a competitor's wall. There was something about the bees that was different. And I knew nothing about bees really practically at this point. This was like my first real experience with them. And so I was beginning to learn things about them um, and from people talking to me from the beekeepers on site and I was learning to paint around them. There was an observation hive that was literally the exit for the observation hive was in the middle of the mural. So I was learning about bees by being around them. They were landing on my paintbrush when I painted and my rule was I was in their space. They were not 
in mind. Like I, if I felt uncomfortable and started getting nervous, I just backed off and took a break in the shade for a little bit. And when I checked myself and I felt comfortable enough to be around these critters, I went back and I began to build a relationship like that. That was really the beginning of the uh, a relationship with real bees, you know? Um, and at the same time, people were coming up, I'd be up on the, the scaffolding or ladder or whatever, and I'd see people come up. And my favorite example was the time I turned around and there was this young woman who had tattoos all over her arms and nose piercings and tons of piercings. And she was standing there talking to like the 80 year old conservative farmer, presumably fairly conservative farmer. And I just saw both their heads nodding in unison, looking the same way. That's the energy I talk about when with that story earlier in the talk. I noticed that people were starting to come up and just stand there looking through the same window. Like I was just painting a big window on the wall that they could both look out of. It wasn't about telling anybody anything about what to do or how to do it. And I loved that. I loved that they would then, whenever people were ready, they will come up and they'll ask me a question. And if I know the answer, I'll tell them what I think I know and if I don't, but we almost always end up in these amazing conversations like the bees were opening this door to connection. And I was, though that curiosity I've come to see as like one of the most beautiful traits that humans carry. Our curiosity is when we're, when a human being is in curious mode, they're so attractive. Everybody wants to be around somebody who's in the process of doing something interesting. It's not always about the answer being plunked in front of you. And that's where the art really facilitates it. The creation of it is as important as the finished product with The Good of the Hive and my work. Um, so on that project, um, they, did, they made the, the mural site uh, a water stop on one of those rides going across Florida to raise money for hungry kids. And Great. I was like, okay, captive audience will see bees. My whole thing was we got to raise awareness about this big issue. And so it, it, it seemed great. And it was, it was a great day. And on that day, the, one of the producers of that ride came up to me and he literally had a little honeybee perched on his shoulder. And he came up to me and said, this bee is telling me to come and talk to you. And I said, really, what's the bee saying? And we got into a conversation. And he asked me flat out um, how many bees were in a healthy hive. And I had literally just learned that the day before between 30 and 60,000. So I told him and he looked at me and he said, do you think you could paint 50,000 of them? And it was like this second lightning bolt moment from that time in my apartment in New York to like, I, I was just obsessed with bees from that time. And then here was this like, I think I'm gonna see if I can do this. And there were only 16 bees in that first mural. And I was completely delusional about what it would take, all of it. I didn't think about any of that. I just went with this gut feeling that he was there to tell me that, to like launch me on a mission. And there's, um, and at this point it's, I've done 35 projects um, 8,530 something bees, um, one at a time and maybe more, I don't know. Sometimes I think I underestimate, but I painted in, um, Florida, uh, ne Lyons, Nebraska, Southern California, DC. There's a couple of murals. There's one at Smithsonian's National Zoo at this point on the Great Ape House. Um, I've painted in Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza with the World Council of Peoples and for the United Nations and um, the New York City Parks and Rec. And I painted my first mural in the UK last fall and all over North Carolina, I did Burt's Bees Global Headquarters. Um, and it just keeps going, it's unfolding. Um, I'm slated to go back to do a, my next mural is on a planetarium in Burnsville, North Carolina. 
I'm really excited to tell the story of bees and flowers and pollination at our feet all the way up to the stars. We're, we're really going to lean into anything being possible. But it was, um, but it's been quite a journey, six years now. You know, that was 2015 when that first mural happened in LaBelle. And um, you have a few actually in the, in, um, North Carolina jumped on like crazy. So there's one in Carborough, there's one in Chapel Hill, there's one in Durham, there's one in Raleigh, there's one in Charlotte, there's one in, um, there was a tiny one in Asheville, but it got erased because it was on a skate ramp in a skate park and they just mowed it away. <laughs> like as it, as it got plowed over for years, it disappeared. But, um, but that was pretty cool. I photographed it along the way. And really this whole thing is about continuing. You know, I'm only, I'm still under 10% of the way, but that was always the point. I never thought anyone was gonna take me seriously at all until I had 10,000 bees under my belt. And people have jumped on a little sooner than anticipated, which is great. Um, I'm creating a film uh, this fall, which is gonna hopefully launch a series. Um, and the series will, isn't just about me. The first show will be about the, the origin of my, my doing this work, but then it's gonna be about the people. It's gonna be like festooning bees, if anyone knows what festooning bees are. It's when they link to create these shapes, they actually measure with their bodies. They hang like these ones right here and they connect and they lift each other up and they, they, they measure, they do all sorts of things by, by linking together. So that's really the next phase of the good of the hive. It's like that, the idea, I often use bee metaphors, but the swarm, which is this healthy expansion. I feel like it's time to, to go into an expansion mode at this point, um, even though I'm gonna continue on with my 50,000, how do we take this story even bigger and talk about trees and talk about soil and talk about water systems and food systems and social and racial justice because that's one of the things that more than anything they the bees seem to have shown me that this this separation this idea of us being separate from the world we live in is an illusion that connection that we have, all we have to do is choose to lean into it. And it can take us anywhere and preferably toward health, preferably toward a healthier planet, which is what I've found. And so and it, it's optimistic and it's empowering and it's exciting. Like there is nothing about the good of the hive in the last six years that hasn't been a complete adventure. Sometimes it's difficult. I've had financial hardship. I've had difficulties for sure i've had um but it wasn't anything that didn't just get worked out or 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 get moved through through like laughter or connection or friends or someone came along and helped out and lifted up you know it just has been this process of life i think that so often like bugs when i think about them people have such a reaction to them like just such a visceral reaction to bugs until you shift your perception of them. And a friend of mine always says a miracle is just a shift in perception. So if you can change the way you see them, like the way that I changed the way I saw a honeybee, like the, where that can take you is an adventure. It's completely exciting like anything else until we understand that fire can burn us yes it could burn us and hurt us but once we understand fire it's beautiful and it's amazing and it can warm us and cook and do all these things so i'm getting a little off what i was going to talk about but um and the last thing i just want to leave you guys with and then i guess we can go to questions um you know, is the biggest thing I've probably learned from this, because my work, as much as the bee is a symbol for my work, my work is about change. It's about how do we shift things like insect devastation in, and pollinator problems, and how do we get in the realm of solution? How do we change people collectively to see it differently so that we just shift it. Um, it's not impossible at all. 
And so the thing I'm always left with is how did I change myself? How did I decide to look at something differently and operate differently in relation to it? And then that just expands everywhere we go. Even if it, you're not an artist, you can, what you talk about at you know, a cocktail party changes people. People get excited when you're excited about something. If you're expressing fear about something, people get, mm, there's trepidation. So I think the way that we talk about bugs <laughs> is like revolutionary. Like I think it really has the potential to change the world. And, um, and I think that, I mean, I could talk for days, but I really want to hear if there's any questions specifically that people wanted to know about. Matt, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. If we were uh, together on site here at the museum, I would instruct everyone to give you a great big round of applause right now. Instead, I'll tell everybody to just drop their appreciations over in the chat, all the clapping hands emojis uh, for, for getting to learn so much about the good of the hive and, and how you came to this project. I mean, really inspiring stuff, especially working in a, in a science museum where we you know our goal here in so many ways is to inspire people to appreciate and then begin to care about the natural world and to see all of the different ways that that we can take advantage of inspiration and curiosity in order to bring people into that space like you know here sometimes we do it by you know i get on stage and i blow things up and that's amazing and awesome and people get excited about science in that way but then also get that connection to science and nature through uh, the the artwork that you've done and seeing the process of it as well i think that's just incredible and apparently everybody else does too because they're dropping appreciations uh all over all over the chat for you i'll remind everybody drop your questions too because we do have uh, questions for you. Let me see. Okay, let me get these pulled up. Okay, Jonathan has the first one, if you're ready. Have you ever pressed your ear against an active hive? Oh, Matt, I think you're muted. There, better? Um, Yes, I have, and I, I've been, I have, I've met many people over the, the last six years that are beekeepers. And so um, I have had the opportunity to do hive dives and hang out with bees and um, even bee sanctuaries uh, and spend some time with them for sure. I hope someday to spend more time with them, but I'm on the road, so I don't have them at home yet. I have not kept bees. Uh, I happen to know this Jonathan in the chat who is a beekeeper. He writes the sound is amazing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Lisa wants to know if you can talk a little. I don't think you mentioned this, but Xander's bee. Yeah, Xander is an amazing kid in Carborough. And when I did the mural on the fire station in Carborough, he was just watching me the whole time. He lived like a block away. And um he and i didn't even know he had a hearing impairment at the time um i guess it was evolving but a couple of years later i was on a project and i saw on facebook that his mom was looking helping him pick the color for his uh cochlear implant that he was getting and it was just this little circle and i thought that looks like a really interesting place to paint a bee. So I, I reached out to her and said, would you like, maybe Xander might like a bee on there. And when she mentioned it to him, he immediately said, that would be amazing because everybody asks me about my implant all the time. And then I can use it to raise awareness about the bees. He wanted to become a little activist. And, uh, you know, that's like an art activist dream when you like get one that's like, into what you're doing. So I went and painted, we, I, there's a video on my website about the experience painting the bee on his implant and about him. So yeah, that was a really special one. That is the smallest project. It was a life-size bee 
one on a long <laughs> cochlear implant, but it was amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's incredible. All right, let's see here. Oh, Renee wants to know if you've put together a book of all of your mur murals so far. Um, I haven't yet. And the website is going to be, the new website is going to be a very cohesive. I spent a lot of time this summer actually going through old photos and um, putting together a really beautiful page for each project all the way up to current time. That'll be up in October um and viewable so that will be my first version of that at some point i would love to do that um and we'll see you know it's just a matter of right now i'm i'm working on the film and i think that's a way that i can really reach the most people i'm just trying to maximize on how we can raise as much awareness and rally as many people toward um creating change uh, in this arena. And just one little plug, if anybody's in upstate New York, I'm speaking, I'm testifying on Monday the 20th at the state capitol um, alongside the NRDC, Sierra Club, Audubon Society. Um, and we're trying to get a bill passed um, or a bill to the, yeah, a bill that would put a moratorium on the use of neonicotinoids in New York State. Now that would be the first of its kind um, in the United States. So it would just stop the use in certain uses of it for more testing and until we know what to do about it. And it blows my mind that those are still so readily used and available all across the United States when there's ways around all this. But my work right now is about getting those stories out there. Like, how do I carry messages so that, that we know what's really going on and how we can change it? So if a book does that in the future, I'm in, you know. There you go. Excellent stuff. All right. Uh, do you ever teach others to paint bees with you? Renee writes that that could be a fun collaboration. I've done that many times. We actually did that at the, <clears throat> at the museum. Um, in North Carolina during Bug Fest. I had, you know, a lot of the time I'll just line up a bunch of kids uh, with their drawing pads, little paper and um, paint, however they want to do it. I usually let the teachers help guide on a lot of that. But then we try and, you know, we look at the bees I'm painting and we paint them together. And the other thing I've done many times is I have people come and paint petals of flowers on the actual mural. So people get to have an experience of touching. I don't do it on all of them. Some of them are up too high. They have to be, has to fit, has to be a ground level, all that. But that's been really fun for people as well. Oh, how cool is that? Okay, Ashley wants to know, as you speak about expanding your project, what are your thoughts on what that would look like? Yeah, um, I have a lot of thoughts on what that would look like. Um, there's I like I don't I'm I'm an artist so I'm also the president of this very very small organization um, but the idea was always that somebody would come in that would help me manage so if it's like I've often thought it would be great to begin to have young artists come in that were like apprentices working with me and learning how to do this because it's the good of the hive is a bit more than just painting an image. You, I go into a community and I get to know the community. We create events. I've done everything from a hip hop dance party. Um, like I stuck a rap artist on a roof of a community center and we lit it up like Las Vegas and danced. I mean, and, and I do film showings. I do talks, panel discussions, all sorts of things um, around the mural. And so, it's really a little different than just coming in and creating an image, but I've often thought it would be great to have a bunch of art activists that I could send to other places because I have hundreds more inquiries into my inbox than I could possibly ever do because I paint slowly and um, I believe in that presence of being there with the work 
um, but I'm always looking at how I can do that. The, the, the TV show is one way I'm really looking to be able to expand into other, the stories of other people and their work. I've met an enormous amount of amazing people that nobody knows anything about while I've been doing this work. And I wanna share their stories too. Because I think the only other thing I'll say about that is I think there's, we're just so beaten down by the media that there's so much negative stuff happening, but there's really like so many examples of people doing amazing things with their entire life that you never hear about. I mean, you might hear it on a local level, but you never get, they never get the big press. Um, so that's where I think the more we can see those, it makes, calms me down, makes me feel safe, like an optimistic, like we're gonna do this, we're gonna turn some of these things around, but you have to see it. Otherwise it's just theory. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Um, Lisa wants to know how can people support your work? Um, how can people, that's always a tricky one. It's my work or the bees, you know, like there's so many things. Um, supporting my work right now, I'm doing a crowdfunding um, for the film. It's uh, about halfway funded and typical me, I'm blazing forward anyway, <laughs> just some faith, <laughs> it's going to work and that's okay. Uh, but there's rewards in there of like getting to have your name in the credits and prints that you earn, or I've got a um, certain amount of entries for an original painting that I'm making that's gonna be uh, lottery drawn for. Um, but that's one way it would really help me out to, to help me with the film. But in terms of generally, you know, there's, I often say this, it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be someone else. Um, I'm, the Good of the Hive is not a nonprofit. I'm a socially conscious for benefit business. I didn't know anything about running a nonprofit. So I thought, why do that? So I just creatively and entrepreneurially figure it out each time. But what I would suggest is if you do have any money, like five bucks, can find someone who's consistently doing something and support them monthly. Like not just one time donation, but follow them along. And there's a few people on Instagram that, you know, you can always follow me on Instagram too. I'm always looking, that helps me share the message out more broadly. That's the good of the hive, uh, at the good of the hive. But, um, but consistently checking in with people and saying, you're doing a great job, keep going. Or like, I saw what you're doing. I see this connection and share it with them, you know? And those kinds of consistent people have really walked me through some difficult times. It's not the easiest path to go paint pollinators all over the world. I mean, I have a blast doing it. It's an adventure, but it, adventures have all sorts of ups and downs. And being a consistent person that even from your cubicle at your corporate job, if you can check in with them and say, hey, how are you doing? It means a lot, it really does. Excellent, excellent stuff. All right, with the with the few minutes we have left, you know, I'm I'm curious how you maintain motivation to keep painting bees and pollinators. Um, I mean, like you just now mentioned that you know adventures have you know challenges and rewards, but as an artist to to say okay, fifty thousand bees, that's even if you know the 50,000 is just sort of a, a pie in the sky, I'm just gonna go out and paint a lot of bees. But to be on that sort of one uh, theme for, for an artistic project, it seems like it's gonna take a, a long time and a lot of effort. So where do you pull the motivation to, to keep pushing on that goal? Yeah, um, one is I'm naturally drawn to see what's gonna happen next because the whole thing is an unfolding. Um, so each project takes me in a new direction. I don't like, like this pollinator right here is a, a butterfly that's native to China, you know? So like this piece is very different in concept. It was about something very different. Um, so each project that comes along, I look at it as new. 
I'm mm -hmm. each one is different. Each one fuels something different in me. I also want to see what happens when I painted these 50,000 beads. Like there's something that I'm going to feel at the end of that, but there's no way I can know what that is until I get there. And it may be that people for the last 10,000 are having to hold my 102 year old paintbrush. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing it's like, you know, 15 more years is my guess. So I have plenty of energy for that. But the, the idea was always to be as present as possible. Like it's that local, global, but present, but also expansive at the same time. And there's very rare things that do that. There's very rare ways that you can experience that. And for me, that is part of what motivates me. Um, I also, I just have also enough reference at this point that these amazing things have happened. These people that I've met, I've learned things I couldn't possibly have learned. And um, I just assume there's going to be more of that. You know, and one of the reasons, it's not a motivation, but I would say one of the reasons to do this work is because I'm not a kid. I have a very kid-like personality and people tell me all the time, millennials are like, you're an honorary millennial. I don't know why, but, but I am. And um, I have a youthful demeanor um, because I get excited about things, I guess. But I also am a grown-up. And I believe that grown-ups, our job right now is to anchor change is to say i'm going to consistently be here doing this i'm going to do what i believe in i'm going to research and study and do the best i can but i'm not going to do this for five minutes and then move on the whole idea is that six years ago like if i started six years ago there was a six-year-old who saw me do that they're 12 now they're going to be into their adulthood and out in the workforce by the time i'm done so they will have had this one reference point of something that just kept going. And I believe that that's what the bees are about too. The bees build a hive, they swarm and expand when they need to, they change and shift based on things, but they keep going. They're always in that now and moving forward state. They're not big, I don't, I, as far as I can intuit or I understand, they're not big on the, the past, <laughs> you know? Where are the flowers now, you know? And they go toward the sweet stuff. They go toward the nectar and all these amazing things happen. And I think it's important to be an example of someone having an adventurous life. You know, I just had the opportunity of meeting another fellow pollinator painter um, named Devon Cunningham, who's 86 years old. He's now my dear friend. And I spent three days with him up in Detroit. And we bonded on this idea of just, there's something that needs to be shared and, and shared about and painting it shares it. So we do that. And this is the guy who painted the first black Christ on a cathedral ceiling in 1969. I studied his work in art school and he kept going. And now he's painting pollinators. He actually saw a thing about me. He came into pollinators one way, but it fueled a whole like 75 painting series based on coming in connection with the, the good of the hive. That's what we did during COVID. <laughs> so like there's these experiences that there's no way I can even understand what could possibly be unfolding or happening. All I have to do is hold steady and then those things get revealed. Make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So well spoken too. I mean, um, like Susan over in the chat, or the moderator for today uh, wrote uh, that the love that just the two words anchoring change like that makes it makes so much good sense for uh, for what i think it means to uh to contribute to our modern society um and to do what motivates you or you know to do what sort of gets you out of bed and gives you gives you that energy to keep going and to to positively contribute to society and uh 
Yeah, and making sure it's filled with beauty and adventure. Like those are the keys. Yeah. Like that's the thing. And it doesn't have to be painting. It doesn't have to be music. It doesn't even have to be art. Like doing something, like I know people that like once a day go and do something really sweet for somebody that they happen across anywhere. That one thing, if you do it every single day, you make sure your day doesn't end until you do something sweet or kind for another being. And you don't tell anybody about it. You just do it. That changes the whole world. Couldn't agree more. And uh, it looks like uh, our, our questions, I don't see any new questions in the chat. And uh, those inspiring words might be the best ones to end on. Works for me. So Matt, thank you so much for being a part of the Lunchtime Discovery Series today. Uh, sharing your stories with us, uh, your connections to the natural world in so many ways, and your artwork with people all over the world. Thank you. It was an honor and I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. Hey, folks, I'll remind you, if you want to see one of Matt's murals up close, personal, face to face, you can do that right here in downtown Raleigh at the Museum of Natural Sciences come and visit the Nature Research Center and just ask around. We'll show you where it is if you're having trouble find it, but it's pretty big. We've got giant bees painted on the backside of the museum. So come and check that out. Um, Matt, remind everybody uh, where they can find you online if they want to follow your work. Yeah, it's thegoodofthehive.com is the website. Um, the Good of the Hive or at the Good of the Hive on Instagram and Good of the Hive on Twitter, at the Good of the Hive on Facebook. Um, that's pretty much the spots right now. Great stuff. Everybody, make sure you also check out bugfest.org. There are more Bugfest programs happening today and tomorrow. And then you can also see information about the pollination celebration at Prairie Ridge Eco Station on Saturday. From us here at the Museum of Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental Education, I hope we'll see you all again real soon. Take care, stay safe, keep your community safe, and have a great week. Bye, everybody.